You are now listening to the Serious Growth Podcast with your host, Leo Costa Jr. Welcome to Serious Growth Podcast, another edition. Today's theme for the show, title, whatever you want to call it, I don't care. It's called, how do you know if you're a serious grother? Well, you don't. Unless you're that person that's been down a rocky path, a very long rocky path, mostly uphill, and mostly filled with pain, and pain of different levels. I have a story to tell about someone who I've gotten to know really well. And I think this person comes close to being a serious grother. You, you can determine for yourself. And it was told to me. I'm 27 years old. I'm a former athlete. I'm in the worst shape of my life. For those who have never been in shape before, this doesn't have the same kind of feel or impact. But for me, someone who has always been in the best shape of their life because they were an athlete and one who was very dedicated, being out of shape was never an option. But here I am, 27 years old in the worst shape of my life. And I didn't even know it until one day my buddy, still my buddy, guy named Milt. We're going to leave it at Milt. He hadn't seen me for a long time. And his words to me were, first words, not having not seen me for quite some time. He said, what the hell happened to you? And I looked at him thinking, what, what do you mean? What happened? What happened to me? It's amazing what, what a life of denial can do for you with regard to you being able to get through life without being too sad or depressed because of the real truth. Denial is the card that you play. And uh, you know what? One of the things I like about my buddy Milt is he talks straight. You know, he doesn't care if it really hurts your feelings because that's not the intention. So it's constructive. It all depends on how you take that, right? So he said, what, what the hell, man? Hey, I'm 27 years of age. I got a couple of kids I'm working on in a job that I don't really like, but no, that's another story. And that's my reason. That's my excuse. Boy, aren't we filled with excuses? We all have them. Then, you know, the old saying is most of them stink, but that was my, my, my excuse. I don't have time to get in shape, to be in shape. Of course, that reasoning for my buddy Milt was, that's bullshit. And I said, well, you tell me. I don't have time to go down and, and to a gym. Because he said, go to a gym, fuck's sake. I don't have time to go to a gym. I'm working all the time on, in, on this job, this dairy. I don't have time for that. And once again, I, you know, I didn't convince him, not even from the get-go. Not even when I kept saying it over and over again. You know, sometimes when you say shit over and over again, uh, you, uh, it becomes truth. It's not a real truth, but it becomes truth. Truth enough to be a nice lie at the heart of it. Anyway, you know, we had a nice chat, and he left. And that fucker made me think, because I value his opinion. That's why. When people you don't have value for, they say something. Yeah. I mean, it still hurts. Maybe you blow it off. Not with Milt. He knew me. Childhood friend. He knew me. And so he made me think. All right. What am I going to do? I'm going to get out of this uh, uh, excuse mode and get into or obstacle mode and get into solution mode. I can't go to a, seriously, I can't, I don't have enough time to go to a gym. So 
the next best option was for me to get into the magazines and start reading about fitness and health. Back in those days, it wasn't all this uh, information that you can get or misinformation in so many cases that you can get online. And I had to get a magazine and a whole bunch of them, and I had to read about them. I had to read about fitness. Mind you, this is something that when I was coming through as an athlete back then, uh, coaches didn't want the players like myself who were playing, or they call them specialty positions, to go to the gym because they feared that it would make you bulky, which we know now is, you know, we just didn't have enough information back then. It's the exact opposite. But back then it was not. So point is, I didn't have much reference in, in weight training because that's what Milton told me that I should do. Go weight train, you fat ass. So I'm reading magazines. I thought, okay, it's a start. Now what? Well, I couldn't go to the gym, so I built my own equipment. I knew enough because I was born and raised on a dairy. I knew how to weld. I looked at the, the photos in my magazines of, of a bench, for example. So I made my own bench. It looked like something that came out of uh, prehistoric land. But you know what? That fucking shit worked. It was heavy. Once I got it in the garage, no one could steal it. That's for damn sure. So it was functional. It worked for me. And now, a word from our sponsor. Do you want a bone-crushing grip? Good, because you're going to get one with the amazing new TRS Gripper. It's a progressive grip builder with longer handles and a special ergonomic design that's like a dozen hand grippers in one. Start off easy and work your way up to quickly build your grip strength from wet noodle to pulverizing. The package includes a video from the world-famous strength coach, Dr. Russ Horine, the man who worked with Leo Costa to help bring you Big Beyond Belief and the Bulgarian Power Burst. Dr. Horine shows you a simple and easy to follow workout plan that takes just minutes a day right from in front of your TV set if you want. So click on the link below and let's get started building you a stronger, firmer, bone crushing grip. And I actually taught myself how to weightlift because I had very limited time in the gym. I just didn't because of what I told you with the coaches and their mindset of all that. So I'm learning from magazines and as I go. And after about six months, I thought, hey, I'm, I'm looking a little bit different. I remember taking a photo inside the house in my underwear and like doing a posing shot. I look back now at that and I think, oh my God, I would never show that to anybody ever. But I'll tell you what, it's all point of reference because where I was being in the worst shape of my life to where I was six months later, just from going in and learning on the fly from, you know, at this case, in this point, you know, I'm learning from a different, a lot of different people that are giving their opinions in the, uh, in the magazine, which is actually in some cases even harder to do because you ask 10 people what the best program is to put on muscle, you probably get 10 different answers. So you know what happens? This is part of a, I think, a the serious growth path that you end up getting on because when it comes right down to it, guess what? You have to do this shit yourself. And if you think that you're going to do this and it's all going to be, you're going to get it right the first time, you're not a serious growther. You're insane. And you got a bigger problem than denial. Because it's a, it's you make nothing but mistakes to finally learn how to how to make a little progress. But it's all relative. Six months later, I was like, hey, wait a minute. Now I I got to the point now where I've grown out of my own homemade gym that I made. Uh, that looks like something that was made during dinosaurs. So I had a there's I was there at a crossroad, a little crossroad, you know. You and we all have them. And this journey that we call serious growth. So I had to, I had to make the jump, you know, and, and I had to figure out a way to go to the gym that was about, oh, I guess two or three miles down the road. I had to figure that shit out. I could have used the same excuse that I gave Milton, but all it was was really bullshit excuse. It had to do with how motivated I was and ultimately discipline. Now, here's what I had in my background 
that really helped me. Probably the most important thing, it was discipline. Because one thing for sure in athletics, when you're playing at a pretty high level, wherever you are, if you're playing varsity football, you know, I mean, whatever it, that sport is, there's always a certain amount of discipline that you must have, especially as you're facing uh, tougher and tougher competition. So I had that in my background for sure. And I had a certain mindset. I didn't know any of this, that how this was going to apply and help me throughout my, you know, my life actually. But I was lucky. I was lucky that I was in sport. My dad is, I, I have to give him a lot of credit because my dad didn't have the luxury of going and playing sports in high school because he had to work on the dairy. My grandpa, I love him, but it was just back in those times. My, he wouldn't let the kids go to high school and, and play any kind of extracurricular activity. They had to be on the farm and on the dairy. So for my dad to make that call for me, to allow me to do that, he did me such a, a huge favor. I, you know, you just don't know how important stuff is sometimes until it's way down the road. You don't realize the kind of life lesson that you're, you're getting taught along the way. Kudos to my dad, because again, it allowed me to get into a sport that, that sports that was filled with discipline. And so I had to figure out a way to get into that gym. And if that meant that I had to get in at all insane hours to do that, if I meant that I was had to be, you know, um, uh, deprived from sleep, sleep deprivation, look, it didn't matter. The shit doesn't matter. None of that matters because there's so many things that you can use as, as an excuse. It doesn't matter that I wasn't getting enough sleep because I had to work my schedule around my training schedule now at this point to get to that gym so I could keep training. It didn't matter. I just had to figure out a way how to do that. So I end up, you know, at this gym. It was amazing. All this fucking equipment that actually worked smoothly. My goodness, I felt like I died and went to heaven. Here I am, this gym with all this equipment. I didn't know how to use some of that stuff. But not to worry. I met somebody who happens to end up being a, my, one of my best friends, and I don't have many one of my best friends and he happened to be the instructor at this gym so i'm there kind of finding my way through and 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 uh you know the next thing i know this guy uh that's uh the instructor there at that point he was watching to make sure that people weren't getting hurt pulls me off to the side and says hey why don't you compete i said compete in what in a bodybuilding show and i looked at him i'm thinking what I mean, fuck me being up in front of a crowd in posing trunks. I dropped classes in college because I didn't want to be up in front of people. Believe it or not, you know, um, I was not outgoing that way. And yet as an athlete, I played in front of crowds. That was a different dynamic, you know. But he talked me into it because, you know what, he believed in me. And that's a part of this, this equation because you never can do this stuff as a serious growther. You could never do this by yourself. I mean, you have to be the one that you have to rely on ultimately, because if you're doing it with a partner, there's going to be times where your partner can't make it. They're sick, whatever. And what happens generally for the person that's not really a serious growther, they just probably end up missing that, that workout as well, or the workout that they normally do with the partner is compromised because it's just not quite the same. And that's going to happen. Ultimately, you need to rely on yourself and you need to push yourself to maximum effort every single time, all the time. You need to put yourself in pain every single time. That's part of the equation of becoming a serious grocer. So the point is, I have this guy who's an instructor who, who you know, he, sought, he talks to me after one of my training sessions and he said, you need to do this, man. He finally talked me into it. And I did my show and that show that I did changed my life forever. I want to go back and, and I must tell you that as a part of this story that I ended up on a family dairy because I settled. That's a hard truth. At that time it was, um, you know, dairy business, a family dairy business was something that you could count on 
It has stability. I was married at the time with two kids. And I settled for that. Now, you could make the argument that I did the smart thing because it was something that had stability. But what was missing in that is that I didn't have passion for what I was doing on the dairy. And you don't really realize how important that is until you're that person like, I, I don't know, a high percentage of people are walking around in life today. They're doing something as a job that they don't want to do. Not really. They're just doing it because they have to put some you know food on the table, get a little bit of money, but they hate their fucking job, bottom line. I was that person on the dairy that was giving me this stability. I fucking hated it. And it wasn't in my blood. And I, I told myself, because once, I, I, the reason why I ended up on the dairy is because I, as an athlete, because I played college ball, I got hurt. And I used my, my injury because I, I could have continued on. I wanted to be a pro athlete. I, I, wanted, I used the injury at that point in my life as a reason that I shouldn't continue in that career because, again, the dairy was more stable trying to become a pro athlete that was very unstable the chances of me or anyone becoming a pro athlete at that level slim and that's still uh that's still a fact to this day so there was a part of the reason you know i made that choice but i gotta tell you something when when that when it goes deeper and when you're unhappy you can make that choice but when you become as unhappy as i was that shit falls apart It undermines you because when you get that unhappy, for me, I'll speak for myself. It's awful. Your mind goes into some dark fucking places. And once I competed in that show, coming back to this now, once I competed in that show, I knew in my heart of hearts, and that's something that we all have to uh, to really be willing to do you know my dad used to say or one of my dad's friends used to say if you ever want to know what the problem is go in the mirror you'll you'll find it right there but to finish that and make it more complete you'll also find the solution in the mirror because you can be that solution you don't always have to rely on somebody else to create solutions for you and it's better that you don't so the point is the problem and the solution are right in front of you So here's what I did. And when I think about it, it was fucking crazy. But I knew because I was following my gut, my passion. I knew after that show. I knew I wanted to be a personal trainer or to be in the business of helping people get in shape. I knew that. The problem was at that time and whenever I started in the 80s or whenever, in my town, no one was doing personal training. No one. No fucking one. So when I went to my ex-wife and I told her, because I told myself, if I ever get a chance, this is a pact that I made between me and the mirror and myself down deep. If you ever get a chance, if I ever get a chance to do something that I love to do, that gave me that buzz that my, this, my sports did, I will not question that. I will not question that. I will not fucking question that. I'm going to jump. That's some scary shit. And I understand that. And especially when you have kids and you're, you're, you know, you're working to put food on the table. So when I came to the house that one day and I told my ex-wife, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to become a personal trainer. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't blame her for having a fucking fit or being, um, skeptical of what i'm doing because especially because no one else was doing it i would have too at first it pissed me off that i didn't get the full-blown support but to be honest if i'm being really honest i could understand it now but i gotta tell you something and this is another crossroad there's so many fucking crossroads that we have to have to make choices in our life and it's not always easy and it's not always the right one but it's got to be the one that you think is the best and that could be that you know that might be selfish when you make some of these uh, decisions. 
But I knew at that point, it didn't matter that she didn't, uh, that she wasn't in my corner like I thought she would. It mattered less than the horrifying pain that I was living through every day. That unhappy fucking pain. That turns into hatred. It's awful. If I'm being real, it didn't matter. My solution for that was I'll figure out a way. But you know what? Actions speak louder than words. People say stuff all the time. So to say that, you know, if your significant other is hearing that, I'm going to figure out a way. I mean, I can understand when you, you'll freak out. And, then be on, and, and on top of that, when you come from a family, not mine, that where you've been coddled to a degree, it's double tough to hear that kind of news. I got it. But I jumped. I did it anyway. I was going to figure out a way. To tell you that it was scary is an understatement beyond belief. But you know what? You use that. That's that fear and being scared. That's exactly what you can use as positive fuel. It's not easy because you're scared out of your mind. What if that shit starts creeping in? What if I don't make it? And then what? Well, my rationale was, even though I was a black sheep when I jumped, I got to tell you that back in those days, me going away from the dairy was like being a black sheep. But I thought at the end of the day, worst case scenario, because you got to think things through. I thought if I fail, I can always go back. I can always go back to that, to that, uh, the dairy life that really made me very unhappy, but I can always go back to that. So it wasn't like I was, you know, forever. I couldn't go back. I could have, if I groveled and whatever it took to get back. So I jumped, I jumped ship. All right, let's take a quick break so I can tell you about our product. Do you want a bone crushing grip? Good, because you're gonna get one with the amazing new TRS Gripper. It's a progressive grip builder with longer handles and a special ergonomic design that's like a dozen hand grippers in one. Start off easy and work your way up to quickly build your grip strength from wet noodle to pulverizing. The package includes a video from the world famous strength coach, Dr. Russ Horine, the man who worked with Leo Costa to help bring you Big Beyond Belief in the Bulgarian Power Burst. Dr. Horine shows you a simple and easy to follow workout plan that takes just minutes a day right from in front of your TV set if you want. So click on the link below and let's get started building you a stronger, firmer, bone crushing grip. And I can tell you to train in the gym. People were constantly, this is what led me to believe that I think I, I could have made, a, a, become a personal trainer. Because when I was training, because at this point, after that show, all I wanted to do was get ready to do the next show. Because, you know, as anybody who's ever competed, you know that, that getting ready for one show, unless you're a freak of nature, you don't nail it the first time. Far from it. So all that did, all that, you can call that and look at that in a certain way. You can look at that as failure if you wanted to, because I didn't nail it the first time out. But I used that, that the endless energy, that was stuff that I could use, you know, uh, to get me to the next level, to get my body in a better shape, to compete at a higher level. You know, you just got to, you have to be uh, open-minded and you have to have perfect willingness to do this stuff. And I, I'm just talking about, uh, bodybuilding, but this applies across the board. This stuff that I'm talking about applies in a lot of different walks of life. You got to keep figuring out how to get to the next level. You got to be a problem solver. You have to state the goal. You have to let nothing stop you because you know what? People will stop you. People have, they have their opinions. You know how many times I was told, well, are you crazy? No one's doing this. Friends and family. Sometimes they can be your your harshest critics and can be hurtful. That's just part of the game, folks. The people that are trying to make it out there, that's just part of it. Shut the fuck up. Okay, take it. Take it like a real, in this case, real man. Take it because it's out there. You're going to have people, uh, they're going to be second guessing you, even third guessing you, 
at all times, especially the higher and the more extraordinary the, the goal is. Get used to it. If you can't handle that truth right now, then don't, don't even try because you'll be sorely disappointed and you'll become a victim. That'll make you feel better. So I'm just telling you right now, don't even, don't even fucking try. You got to be honest with yourself when it comes down to this. So here's what I did. I got some really good advice from, from a friend who told me he was in business. He'd been in retail business for a while and, and he was a friend of mine. He said he was one of the ones that he, he was one of the ones that weren't, wasn't telling me you're crazy and out of your mind. He said, hey, just go, you know, while you're, you're learning your craft here in personal training, go to your friends and family. To some degree, they'll cut you. That's a place where you can cut your, your craft and make the mistakes and start learning how to present your style of training, that kind of thing. That was really great information, as it turned out. In between all that, in between all that, I had to go out and find all kinds of jobs. And I will say this. I was really lucky. My ex-wife's father, uh, dad owned restaurants. I became a short order cook. It was part time, but I did the point that I'm trying to make is you do whatever you have to do in order to keep putting food on the table while you're overcoming these huge fucking obstacles because that's the serious growth path that you go on. Even when you're not in the gym, these are all obstacles that could have deterred me. No way, no fucking way. Because I made that commitment. Losing, failing, ultimately was not an option. Failing along the way, oh yeah, there's more failure than success, I believe. It's you need to fail and fail hard in order to keep making progress. Who wants to do that? Who wants to fucking do that? Not many people. They like the idea of it. As I'm training my friends for free, basically, and le- understanding you know, my presentation and making just enough money to get by, it was a struggle. A lot of tension there. Um, as I'm doing that, then I'm getting one person, maybe two people. I couldn't charge very much because I didn't know what to charge. I had no fucking clue as to what trainers were were making. I mean, they made they had trainers in L.A. and they had trainers in San Francisco, but those guys were charging so damn much money. And considering the fact that no one had heard of a personal trainer in my area, they thought I was a, an aerobics instructor when I when I told them what I was doing. Personal trainer? What the fuck is that? Another obstacle. Didn't matter. It didn't matter. I made a commitment to myself. I want to keep coming back to that. I had passion. I had motivation. And ultimately, I had discipline. Unwavering fucking discipline. There's no way that anyone was going to stop me. Even myself. I wouldn't let myself stop me. Fuck that. But here's what I realized. Another obstacle. God damn it. Another obstacle. I realized that the only way that I was going to be able to get more information out, because you need to educate people when you're in that situation. You need to educate yourself, ultimately. For example, when you're learning how to put on muscle, you can read all these magazines with all these people that have their own ideas about what's the best way to put on muscle. But at the end of the day, you have to put the time in. You have to do that shit. You have to educate yourself, and you have to be the ultimate person who makes that decision for which exercise program or way, a style of training is best for you to put on massive amounts of muscle at the end of the day. But you also have to realize that in order to take it to the next level, I realized that I had to educate people. I had to ed- educate the people in my town as to who I was. And I had to educate the people in my town and tell them why they needed somebody like me. I mean, it's amazing to think, especially nowadays, it's amazing to think that women at that time with weightlifting, they automatically thought, I'm not shitting you not even one little bit. No exaggeration. They thought that the minute that they lifted weights, they were going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. They were going to look like a bodybuilder, a weightlifter. They were going to be massive, bulky. 
And at that time, I don't think it's changed much, uh, you know, ultimately, but there was no way that a female wanted to, no way, shape, or form look like that. How the fuck do you overcome that obstacle if you're trying to hit that market? I mean, you don't want to, as a trainer, you don't want to pigeonhole yourself to where you're only training a certain clientele. I mean, it's better than nothing. But if you really want to stay relevant in the industry, then you better you better start thinking about how you need to educate people that have concerns or they perceive this as a negative thing. Well, guess what? That was another obstacle for me because, like I said in the beginning of this podcast, I used to drop classes if there was an oral presentation. And that's, I, that's why I was so freaked out about getting up on stage and competing. It was being up there freaked me out. But I had to go to that mirror again and say, look, it was, it was another moment of truth for me, another crossroad, if you will. It's like if you want to go to the next level and really become a personal trainer like you said you were, you got to keep going back to that accountability and hold yourself accountable all the damn time. Accountability is not something that you say and forget about or discipline or motivation. It's not a passing thought in the night. It's something that you live every day, every single day, every moment. Do you get what I'm saying to you? Think about that. It's not doing it part time. It's not being motivated uh, one month and then, you know, unmotivated for two. You really have to understand that. And that's where I was. It was an easy, easy question for me to answer. At that point, what are you going to do? You have to educate people. What does that mean? Exactly. I had to go out and set up talks. Can you believe that shit? To be in front of people like that? I mean, the only other thing that scared me more, I don't even know if it scared me more, is flying back then. Scared shitless. To go talk? It's in that category for sure. It's a top one or top two. So for me to, again, at that crossroads, say, what the fuck are you going to do? You're going to just sit here and make this like, you know, there's so many personal trainers, even to this day, they don't make a full-time living at it because they don't have this kind of commitment. They're, they do not because they're doing it part-time for the most part. Look, I'm not saying that you don't do it part-time. Some of you are doing it. That's fine. But I'm saying that so there's so many of you are want to be full-time doing this, doing this thing that you love because I'm going to tell you something, ever since I've been in this business, I've never worked a fucking day in my life. And yet I worked my ass off. But the perception of what I'm doing changes everything. I'm doing something that I love. I'm doing something that I would do for free. Unless, you know, if I didn't have to pay bills. I love it that much. If you can't see that and be authentic about that, you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong path, my friends. So I said, you know what? Fuck it. The only way that I'm going to get over my fear, and this fear that I'm talking about in this case is talking in front of people, but this applies in anything that you're doing. Believe it or not, through the course of my journey with my training, there were times that I was fearful. How many of you can say that? Who in the fuck is afraid or fearful about training? Only those that are pushing their body so fucking hard that you're right on the edge of getting injured. You're right on the edge of severely hurting yourself that's that's the trade-off motherfuckers that's the way it works so i had to ask myself what are you gonna do now face my fear face your fears i had i had somebody that was helping me do this by the way i said i want you to call all the places all the 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 gyms, all the health clubs, all the the aerobic centers in the area, and to you tell them I want to come in and talk to their their class. I started with the aerobics classes. I thought I gotta be, I gotta start somewhere, and that's what I did. I went in right before the people were doing aerobics. I would tell them what my what I was doing. I was a personal trainer. And the reason why I was here, because what I did as a part of my personal training, I thought this would help me build my business. The stated goal was to build my business. 
at that point while I was training was I bought a body fat testing machine. So I went into aerobics class and I had to tell people about this uh, way that I was doing body fat testing. It was ultrasound. And I had to tell them how important it was for them to do this. I got a really good question from somebody one time. And I got, listen, I was scared shitless up there. I was trembling. But that's the only way that you can face your fears is to face them head on. The first time is always the worst. It's still horrifying, but it gets, you, you can tolerate it a lot better. You start, you start building a stronger mindset. Well, that wasn't as bad as I thought, and yet it was horrifying. Going back to that question, I had somebody say, say this to me one time. They said, I said, any questions after I told them? I said, I'll be here doing body fat testing if you want, guys want to come over and sign up. Somebody asked me, said, why would I want you to tell me how fat I am? That was such a good fucking question. That was telling. And fortunately, I came through. I told them why. And that's the mark of a great trainer at the end of the day. When you can tell somebody why you're doing a style of training, a certain technique. But that was so telling. I'm glad that happened to me. That was my first, I mean, that was my first presentation that I was trembling at. Why you? Why do I want you, a stranger, a fucking stranger, to tell me how fat I am? And of course, I answered the question. That step, that got me on the right path. That told me because I had all kinds of people then signed up for my body fat testing. Guess what? It's about leverage. Constantly using, working from the inside out, gaining leverage is very much like training in the gym. Gaining leverage to take the next step to make progress. When I was in my, when I was, cause I started doing body fat testing all over, all over, um, you know, the area and many miles away. But when I was there, people were coming to sign up or coming, they signed up to get their body fat test done. And guess what? That would give me a chance to really have them cornered before. When I was talking to the whole group, I'm talking to the whole group. Now I had one person that came into the body fat test. I was thrilled about, you know, telling him, this is what it was, then this is also what I do, in case you're interested. I also do personal training. Why do I need you? See, that question needs to be asked. That's just, that is really important that you continue to ask questions for the serious growth. I'm trying to apply this to when you're in the gym trying to get serious growth, you have to keep asking those questions. Why? What am I doing? What's the stated goal? That's how I applied all that. And the rest is history. I built up a huge uh, personal uh, training clientele, and I've never looked back. And it's actually been um, recession proof. It's been divorce proof. It's been a lot of proof, pandemic proof. Never, never once have I ever had a client deficit. And there's a reason for that. I was all in. I was all in. Not only was I all in in my serious growth training, my because I wanted to become a bodybuilder that competed then at that point. As soon as I was making money and I was, you know, I could really start focusing on this is I'm going to keep getting better, compete at higher levels. But this stuff that I was learning along the way, figuring out how to create a business, you see, I was using the same sort of strategy to get there. It was all one. This has all been one for me. And it's not easy. Most of the time, it's, it's, it's very difficult. In the gym, we've talked about this before. Who in the hell wants to step in the gym and be in pain? Put yourself in pain day in and day out. Who wants to do that? It's somebody who's got passion. It's somebody who has perfect willingness. But ultimately, it's somebody who's disciplined to the nth degree. That's part of the serious gold training creed. And you know what? It gets to the point where you're almost a little bit insane out of balance, out of touch a little bit, because in my estimation, in my opinion, you have to be a little bit touched in the head to get up every morning at three o'clock in the morning when you don't have to. To when I was competing at one point, I had to do cardio, get up at midnight to do cardio so I could make everything else happen, my business happen. I had kids that I was dealing with that I wanted to make sure I was present None of that shit mattered to me. Figure out a way. Oh, I had to get up at, at 
one, two o'clock in the morning, even though I had to be at work at three or four or five in the morning, it didn't matter. See, I was so in, but <laughs> here's the shit that I started hearing when I'm at this point, five words. Why can't you be normal? Why can't you be normal? I heard that so often. I heard that. And when I heard that, and I still, when I hear that, that became, you talk about fuel, that created a hatred inside of me because I, I think that hatred is awful to some degree. It can be. But again, as I'm telling you, you can use it as, as fuel. The more the hatred, the more the rage that I felt inside my body, I just let that shit come out in the gym. You let adversity, that was an adversity to me, either define or destroy you. You got to keep making that choice. You're never off the hook. You're always faced with crossroads. You're always faced with challenges. You're always faced with critics. Fuck them. And fuck you that wanted me to be normal. Fuck that. Pound sand. Pound sand. I'd rather die than be fucking normal. I'll leave you with that. Until next time, Serious Growth. Peace out. Thanks for listening to the Serious Growth Podcast. For more episodes like the one you just listened to, subscribe to us on your mobile podcast app and leave us a review. If you'd like to reach out, you can find us online at SeriousGrowth.com. Until next time, train smart and train hard.